Now I'd like to invite Mr. Tariq Khan, Registrar, International Arbitration and Mediation Center, to deliver the welcome address. Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Sanjay Kishan Kaul, Judge Supreme Court of India. Honorable Justice Rajiv Shagdhar, Judge High Court of Delhi. Honorable Mr. Siddharth Luthra, Senior Advocate, Supreme Court of India. Senior members of the bar present here. Honorable judges present here, younger members of the bar, my friends, family, mentors, members of the print media, electronic media, good evening. Thank you for uh, gracing this occasion with your August presence. And I'm very happy to see Full House. Uh, it's it's at actually a matter of great privilege for us as authors to welcome you all. Two years ago when I and Dr. George, we were discussing in the High Court, the issue with re, uh, regard to the law relating to micro, small and medium enterprises as to how there is dearth of literature on the subject and that we should really contribute and come up with some kind of uh, piece of paper which pertains to uh, law relating to MSME wherein we can really clarify certain lacunas because there has been a void for a very long time and there was hardly any literature available. Thereafter when we started working on this article for a peer review journal we actually felt that there is a uh, issue because there is no book or any literature on the subject that we can refer to for coming up with this article. And today as I stand here and I'm discussing with you this work which started from an article has culminated into a book. And I'm very, very glad that we have been able to finish it and we have been able to contribute. And I hope that this book serves uh, the right purpose and both practitioners as well as students are able to benefit from it. So that's the whole idea behind this book. And once again, I'll not take much time because we have some of the finest speakers in the country sitting here. And I'm sure you're more interested in listening to them rather than listening to me. So thank you once again, everyone. I welcome you all. Thank you. Uh, may I now request Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul to kindly formally release the book. And may I request Honorable Mr. Justice Rajiv Shagdar and Mr. Siddharth Luthra to also kindly join in the occasion. I would now like to invite Honorable Mr. Justice Sanjay Kishan Paul to deliver his address. Uh, good evening to all of you, Justice Shagdar, Mr. Luthra, the authors, Dr. Jai, George, and Mr. Khan, uh, senior members of the bar, the other members of the legal fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. to join the August gathering for the release of the book uh, titled Law Relating to Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises. Uh, I would like to start with a long but uh, galvanizing quote by Mahavir Tyagi from the Constitutional Assembly debates. I quote, if you want to combine political democracy with economic democracy, and translate into Dr. Ambedkar's maxim, one man, one unit, then you should make the villages self-reliant and self-sufficient. Otherwise, the millions who are unemployed in the rural areas will never enjoy the fruits of freedom. They will remain slaves of the towns, men as they are today. The way to do this is to give them cottage industries so that they can live happily with their families in their own happy surroundings. 
India's population has uh, predominantly resided in the rural areas and the pre-independence economy found uh, its existence among the rural industries, the local artisans using local resources. The importance of such uh, small-scale uh, industries in our freedom struggle is deep rooted and a representation of the spinning wheel on our pre independence flag is an allegory of the same. The Constituent Assembly debates uh, for the addition of provisions for cottage industries in the Constitution was not a controversial one and a very well accepted by all the members. Mr. Mahabir Tyagi, while pushing the amendment, brought to the House attention to the fact that the purpose of placing this amendment before the house was instead of a muscular power going to the machine he would like to carry the machines to the sources of the muscular power the existing article 43 of the directive principles of state policy in the constitution uh, this is something which is extremely important for the reason that uh, we have seen a large part of migration from the village levels to the cities and people living in difficult situations that is because of lack of uh, opportunity of employment in their own areas. Nobody would carry themselves so far away from their hometowns if those opportunities were there. And the MSMEs are a methodology of spreading it wide all over the country to facilitate the people to stay in their surroundings, as was being said in the constitutional law debates, and also be able to earn from what uh, they were doing. Um, we know the three stages of the economy or the three sectors, the primary, secondary and tertiary. And this is also the sequence of growth in uh, which most of the countries and economies evolved. India did not follow that norm. India is said to have the missing middle problem. We are accused of skipping the rope over the manufacturing sector before entering the tertiary sector. Today, with a world average of just 6%, India's primary sector contributes roughly 20% to its GDP and consuming more than half of our workforce. And with the advent of 1991 reforms, we jumped from the primary sector to the tertiary sector while the manufacturing sector awaited its revolution. The 1991 reforms pushed the development agenda and this focus brought about the centralized industrial growth and several industrial breaths around the country. Despite this, employment generation has remained a top challenge for the policymaker over the years. However, if there is anything to learn from the Chinese economy, it is the ineptness of one-size-fits-all formula in microeconomics. India is a unique country geographically and demographically, and thus the solution that drives its economy must also be unique and suitable for the landscape and difficult to have a uniform fit-all scenario throughout the country. Considering the sheer vastness and diversity of the land and people that exist in India, we cannot sustain this endeavor with a blind focus on development. This will and has resulted in collection of wealth and jobs with only a few. What India needs is an equitable growth and MSMEs are the solution for the same. They have not only contributed towards employment generation, but they are also the way forward to bridge the gap between the rich and poor regions of the country, using our local resources with the aim of self-sufficiency. We have had situations where the raw materials and other sources are much higher in some states, but the lack of opportunities thereafter has made people migrate from there, not utilizing the local resources which exist. As important as it is, a blind faith in centralized industrialization will only result in increasing monopolies and that is possibly not the way forward. Upon uh, briefly browsing through the book, I will have to read through in a vacation time the whole book, I was delighted to observe that the authors have elucidated the evolution of policies and legislations for MSMEs since independence and this gives us a much needed handbook for a deep dive in comprehending the circumstances that led to the growth of the MSME regulations. The dynamic germination of small-scale industries has led to several revisions of its very definition. From cottage industries to small-scale industry, tiny industries, ancillary industries, etc. The criteria and policies pertaining to what we know as MSMEs 
have also matured and the book does justice to understanding and updating the context and the relevance of these regulations. The book's commentary on micro, small and medium enterprise development act 2006 keeps in mind the relevant practical considerations and is thus likely to be of great help to students, legal professionals and several stakeholders. Dr. George and Mr. Khan structure the analysis in a manner that is both reader friendly and informative and thus offer important clarity in a contemporary assessment of law relating to MSMEs. The Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Industries have introduced and executed several schemes and policies to increase the ease of doing business for MSME industries. The policies have focused on employment generation, building risk-taking capacities of small industrialists by introducing credit guarantee schemes, cluster development programs, scheme for regeneration of traditional industries. The Coir Vikas Yojana is an umbrella scheme for skill upgradation and training of potential workers. There also exists scheme to revive and help MSMEs with debts or MSMEs which have become NPAs. These schemes and policies aid in enhancing risk appetite of the MSME industry and further mobilize resources for the sector, especially keeping in mind the last two years of a difficult period. Disputes are expensive time-consuming and bottlenecks in any institution's progress. And I believe working on the judicial solution is equally important as working on legislative solutions. It is important to ensure that judicial machinery provides a nurturing environment for MSME growth. History is ripe with examples that despite several legislation and schemes, conflicts and disputes are prone to arise between different stakeholders. One of the salient features of the 2006 Act is that it contains provisions for dispute resolutions concerning MSMEs which have been discussed in the book at great length. The Act establishes bodies like National Board for MSMEs and Micro and Small Enterprises Facilitation Council which lay down a two-stage dispute resolution mechanism comprising of mediation and arbitration for recovery of MSMEs. This is required really not only for the MSMEs but that being the topic, but is generally required for a dispute resolution process. And I think we have a lot of protagonists of the mediation here and trainers here. So that's one call I make always from any podium I am there that try to resolve your disputes. Businessmen can walk in hand in hand in various opportunities rather than conflict with each other. More so because the ability of the business community to utilize their resources, even if they settle for less, is much more than what uh, prolonged uh, litigation would get them over a period of time. The book also discusses in length the judicial trends of Indian courts in case of inconsistencies between MSME Act 2006 and the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996. In this behalf, the reference to Shilpi Industries case which was a landmark judgment wherein the apex court decided on the issue of limitation and maintainability of counterclaim in arbitration proceedings. The court held that MSME Act will prevail over the Arbitration Act, even in cases where there is a separate arbitration agreement between the parties, as it has an overriding provision under Section 24 of the Act. The court also held that Limitation Act will apply to arbitration proceedings initiated under the Act, as per section 43 of the 96 Act. The book discusses in depth the gap left behind by this judgment as the court decided that benefits under MSME Act will only be given to those suppliers who have registered under the Act as on the date of entering into the contract. In India, less than 20% of the MSMEs are registered and therefore this judgment will have a far-reaching effect on the unregistered sellers who will not be able to take the benefit of the 2006 Act. The ambiguity and conundrum are likely to continue until the Supreme Court clarifies what is meant in the Silpi industries or until the legislature intervenes. Till then, the debate will carry on. Another impediment in the judicial route of dispute resolution is the ever-growing backlog of matters. Micro, small and medium enterprises are smaller companies with lesser capital, shorter production time, and fewer means to drag disputes into court for years. This had led to several MSMEs 
shutting down, ultimately affecting the growth in our economy. Recently, as a pilot project, in re-expedition trial cases under Section 138 of the NI Act, a bench comprising of Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, B. R. Gawai and Ravindabad directed setting up of 25 such special courts in five districts of Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Delhi and UP, where the pendency of check bouncing case is the highest. I believe the question this raises before us is, should India adopt a similar structure for special courts for MSME matters so as to have a dedicated procedure for dispute redressal in MSME matters to expedite its proceeding? Another route that can be discussed is whether India needs special tribunals on ad hoc basis with members who are experts, but then our experience with tribunals has hardly been satisfactory, nor is the reflection of the 138 cases uh, really an example to follow, because that is what has inundated a lot of courts. So, I believe the solution should come from the stakeholders in the MSMEs, the business people who have uh, a stake in it, and people like the authors of the book, who can possibly suggest methodologies that given the prolonged litigation system we have, how best to resolve disputes in a quick manner so that the business itself doesn't go down in the process. The authors have painted an elaborate picture that attempts to capture the law relating to micro, small and medium enterprises, as the title suggests. They have brought out multiple points of departures for everyone in the legal profession to ponder upon. In this book, the authors have captured the essence and importance of the manufacturing sector of India that has no small part led to India's growth. Small-scale industries have become crucial for our economy's growth, especially in the non-agriculture sector. To keep the oil burning, we should learn and build from our past so that we may navigate towards a sustainable and equitable future for our all citizens. For Nelson Mandela once said, we must work together to ensure the equitable distribution of wealth, opportunity and power in our society. I congratulate the authors on bringing out this book and thank you for the opportunity they gave to me to share my thoughts with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for these enlightening words. I would now like to invite Honorable Mr. Justice Rajiv Shagdar to deliver his address. You know, after Justice Call finished his speech, I whispered into his ear and I said that you've covered the entire uh, area. Can I just say I do, as in, <laughs> agree with him, as uh, we used to do when we were sitting in the bench together. In fact, this reminds me of an old joke. I don't know how many members uh, of the bar have heard this. Uh, I think Justice Call has heard this. There used to be a judge. Um, uh, in uh, one of the courts in the middle part of India uh, who was riled by his uh, colleagues saying that every time a judgment is sent by the senior judge you just say I agree, I agree which is what I wanted to do. So the next time around when the judge, draft judgment was said he said I disagree. <laughs> and uh, then the senior judge called him he said listen all this is all right you disagreed uh, but then you have to give reasons also. So he says I agree. <laughs> so I have two options now to sit down here and say I agree and then you know the baton will get passed to Mr. Luthra and uh, he is paid for speaking, I am not. <laughs> this time he may not get money uh, in cash, uh, sorry in check. <laughs> but you certainly get it in kind, there will be a lot of goodies, I am sure, tea and coffee. But coming to, since I have to earn my tea, if uh, Amit and Tariq are offering us a cup of tea. but. Uh, you know, there's another reason why I was very diffident about accepting this uh, invite from uh, Amit. I call him Amit, he's, though he's got this uh, very serious appellation of Dr. Amit George. Whenever he appears before me, I'm not too sure whether to call him Amit George, Dr. Amit George. But in all that muddle, I uh, managed to sort of conduct the proceedings. So, years ago, uh, you know, when he was uh, still a young lawyer and a little wet around the ears, if I'm, I have the liberty of using that expression. Uh, 
he sent a very evocative post to his senior he was then deviling in his senior's chamber he was not working on his own now as he is now the senior was uh, my namesake and to his grief the senior passed on the post to me so when i read the post it had a very interesting caption which was referring to me i don't want to describe the picture that the caption carried it said smiling assassin <laughs> so, <laughs> every time he calls me i'm not too sure whether i should accept an invite because i don't know which is the next post that he's going to <laughs> but having said so uh, to my mind uh, amit represents uh, the best in the bar there are lots of young lawyers who are equally good uh, i see some of them over here uh, he has an outstanding ability to put across a difficult matter in as easy a manner without getting ruffled you see one of the things that i always uh, uh, like to share i don't know whether i was able to practice it but now i have the right to you know advise and uh, speak from the uh, podium as i say is uh, you know uh, we may or may not agree but uh, in the process let's not lose civility i mean you can still say the same thing by not uh, keeping the decibel under control and uh, ultimately it's not your personal that's the why that's the reason why we have counsel it's not your personal case and uh, proceedings are uh, conducted better if uh, there is an element of uh, you know uh, a little bit of humor with the serious input about the matter so that's in so far as uh, my introduction about uh, amit is concerned but uh, in so far as uh, tarik is concerned i have not had i have not had the uh, privilege of uh, interacting with him uh, uh, you know directly this is the first time i could put the name and face together but i have read the book and uh, it shows deep scholarship it shows a great amount of learning i'm sure it's a combination of efforts of both uh, dr george and uh, tarik khan uh, the product is there for all all of you to see coming back to the book that's what i have to earn and speak on is uh, that as i was uh, sort of i did take the time out yesterday since our courts are closed to ramesh through the book it's a neatly done piece it's about 250 pages though the font is a little small uh, and uh, you know it's divided into four chapters the interesting part of the book is that uh, it goes to the genesis of how these msmes came about msmes have become a buzzword but one should remind uh, oneself both the user the practitioner as well as those who are not uh, within the domain of judiciary or function within the domain of judiciary is that this is not a new concept it started right when we got independence in 1948 and 51 when we had the first five year plan the small scale industries the thought of small scale industries was rooted there and and it's no surprise because we had you know tall leaders led by gandhi ji who believed in khadi who believed in village industry so the first five year plan uh, rooted uh, in a sense or seeded the small scale industry and if you look at the history you will see that uh, for a very long time up until 1991 the ssi was firewalled it is in 1991 when everyone felt that india had a hindu growth rate and therefore we must liberalize which is a good thing the authors also say so but interestingly the authors actually flag something which is very important which is it in a sense disrupted the ssi industry it also in a sense uh, gives a little bit of a peek into uh, <laughs> let's say what's their philosophy in life so it's a difficult uh, act it's a you know you need to be a trapeze artist even as a policy maker how do you liberalize an economy and still protect certain sectors which is uh, ie the ssi now the government of the day uh, starting from 1993 onwards um, enacted the interest uh, what is that interest on delayed payments act of 1993 where they ensured that the payment obligations 
to SSI units are um, adhered to. So they sort of strengthen them by saying, listen, if someone owes money to them, I'm putting it in simple words because I don't know whether all of them are lawyers or not, but maybe some of us have not looked at the act, is that your payments would be honored and there was a certain rate of interest that had to be paid, coupled with what Justice Call explained in his opening speech. I'm just putting it simply, I don't have the wherewithal that he has, is that, <laughs> is that they provided for an alternate dispute resolution, which is arbitration. So, all that put together, uh, in short, that at least when monies, uh, monies are owed to uh, SSIs or micro, small and medium scale industries, they are honored. So, from 93, we had the 2006 Act, the interest rates that can be awarded are now actually three times the bank rate. Sometimes, I don't know, uh, whether as lawyers appearing for a non-SSI uh, or let's say the debtor who owes money to an SSI industry, it does become difficult because if the rates, uh, if the bank rate is high, three times that can be killing. With no discretion in the statute for judges and the policy makers may have good reason to do that. As I said, it's, it's, it's a very difficult act for a policy maker. As a judge, sometimes, and I've had those cases, I, I feel it's, it's, it's sometimes too burdensome. But then if you look at the, 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 the uh, perhaps if you look at the history, the policy, uh, if you were to sign a judgment, I don't know which way it will go if, if a case was there, but I would ultimately do it. Why? Because you're bound by what is written in cold print over there. But this is the thought which one should take to the policy makers. Should there be some play in the joints for the courts? Now, we, I find a lot of those statutes where there is actually no play in the joints. Uh, one of the examples that comes to mind is uh, when we see, uh, when we um, uh, hear challenges to an arbitration award under Section 34. Now, the way the statute reads, the way the recent judgment reads, there are only two options with the judge. Either he sustains the award or he sets aside the award. There is sometimes a third option. You just need to tweak it a little, parties are agreed, everyone is agreed, but the statute is not in agreement. Uh, well, some of us have found uh, an easier way where we kind of cajole parties, especially on interest, that if you consent, I don't know, I've taken that risk, whether the Supreme Court sustains it or not, is if parties agree, then the rate of interest can be brought down provided payments are expedited, the award is honored. Uh, so that's one area which uh, is something that the policy makers or the legislatures should consider. The other area which uh, sort of uh, is something that again the policy makers need to take into account is that uh, in the definition of uh, operational creditors in the IBC, an MSE industry is included. Now if they are included and in the waterfall mechanism that they have, they are much lower then the entire purpose of MSME ED Act is lost. If you're trying to secure their payments and they have to go by what the COC or the creditors committee decides and take a haircut, in any case, they are a, a small setup and you tell them to take a haircut, there'll be nothing left as, uh, you know. <laughs> no, anyway, don't, uh, you know, don't, <laughs> don't try me out on that because if you put your hand on my head, this is some, I don't want to grow it. <laughs> it's difficult to tear. So these are those concerns which, uh, you know, sometimes as a adjudicator, when they come up before you, they, they challenge you. Uh, sometimes you are able to navigate, negotiate, etc., etc. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes you uh, take um, uh, a leap of faith and hope the Supreme Court sustains it. Most often in my case, they reverse it. But anyway, that doesn't matter. But you keep trying because uh, as they say, every judgment becomes um, uh, an edifice for uh, some some judgment, some day, etc., etc. So, I am happy that this uh, work has seen the light of the day. As I said, Tariq and uh, uh, George have done a wonderful job, and uh, I hope that uh, they take out time to have a supplement, which actually deals with the other minefields that uh, SSI industries face while negotiating not only this act but other acts. And I end with this small note 
which is that when i was reading this book you know i was reminded of lawyers and uh, we have lawyers who fall into this you know micro small and medium scale <laughs> industry they also need help i don't know how the bar council of india will help them so thank you and the five star councils of course too thank you very much god bless you thank you sir for sharing these profound insights with us uh, i would now request mr pulkit to present a bouquet to uh, mr l nageswar rao former judge supreme court of india i would now like to invite mr siddharth luthra to deliver his address Justice Call, Justice Shaktar, Honorable Justice Justice Nageshwar Rao, my friends, Dr. Amit George and Dr. Tariq Khan, and other senior colleagues and other colleagues and friends in the audience. The Indian economy has been uh, interestingly predominantly usually an agricultural economy, and with the increase in population, there was a need felt on how to develop this economy. So the whole purpose was. let's look at msme as justice call pointed out and the book very aptly deals with it and with the contribution of about 27% of our economy it's really at one level become the backbone of our economic structure it has seen a growth rate of 20% and uh, 10% and 20% of the msmes are in uh, the semi urban and rural sector and that becomes very important for a country like india primary focus of course has been diverse with all areas such as production manufacturing preservation pres preservation processing of goods and commodities with the 6.11% of the manufacturing gdp uh, 24.63 of the gdp from service industries what's most important in my view is that 6.33 crore msmes employ 11.10 crore people in 9899 it used to be 11 or it used to be about 1.7 crore people so we've almost seen more than a five time increase in the employment in the last 30 years recently i don't know if you had occasion to read or listen to the first arun jetli memorial lecture on 8 july and we had a senior minister from singapore mr tharman shanmugaratnam who talked about the singapore model it was a very interesting talk and i had the privilege of being present where he mentioned that the trickle down effect of economy has failed and even in india though we sought to promote msmes we have really gone after heavy industry from the beginning of our independence and therefore we have failed to create jobs now this becomes very crucial today and the perspective that we have to look at is on the one hand we are looking at technology we are developing bringing in new systems uh computerization electronic uh, payments what is it doing it's increasing speed and efficiency but it's reducing employment and that is the place where msmes have the most important role because eventually msmes are essentially often more often than not labor intensive and they also take jobs to the people unlike heavy industry which will be set up in certain specific places with ancillary industries coming in msmes really take jobs to the people because they operate as has been noted by the authors as well in the semi uh, urban and rural places since 1991 this change has taken place uh, justice call talked about liberalization but is our industrial growth and our industrial behemoths are they doing justice to the people in a country with 1.3 billion odd people are these industrial behemoths going to provide the necessary engine for economy economic and social equality and growth the problem is we can't have a situation where some earn and then the state has to subsidize others because eventually what you also need is dignity in 
employment you need dignity of work and dignity in your social life and therefore social development can only be possible when we work on the msme sector there's another problem which we face especially in north india you will see it especially in you know central north india with the inheritance going the way it is families increasing land holdings have become very small so the agricultural sector today people's farms used to be 30 40 50 acres subject to uh, land holding of course laws but now they become a large farm holder maybe 5 or 10 acres now he's he or she is trying to make eke their living but that's not good enough and therefore the agricultural sector in the last many decades has thrown up a lot of unemployed people people who are struggling staying on some have shifted to things like dairy farming and other other avenues of employment but the jobs are just not there and at this time as i said the focus on msc's becomes very crucial for india's social and economic growth and i focus on the word social speaking of the book fascinating i've had a chance to glance through it uh, four chapters with the first two chapters dedicated to the evolution and they've looked very sensitively at the policies that were brought in and how the policies were not as successful as envisaged they've uh, talked about the various legislations and the issues in the first two chapters and for lawyers they've also been very kind to address a chapter on the dispute resolution mechanism so people who want to practice or look at this area of law it's going to be a very web valuable asset they've referred to of course we know that there was a challenge to the laws and that's been settled by the supreme court in the 2021 silphi industries case challenges and the new developments are addressed in the fourth and last chapter of the book and though they talk about the benefit of establishing small and medium business model but it comes with practical sets of challenges in terms of compliance with global standards shifting to dig- digital mediums even gst is a challenge for smaller enterprise and all of these have been touched upon in the book and therefore that is the place where we need perhaps greater governmental support for the msme sector uh the constitutional validity of uh, this act was challenged it's been dealt with they've uh, talked about it and uh, the manner in which section 18 and 19 were deemed to be inconstitutional and the court has cleared that was the challenge the court has cleared the view that's been dealt with the, and they've referred to the supreme court judgments the authors also tell us about the amendment in 2018 the amendment bill which reemphasized on the old act of 2007 and the whole purpose was to make it transparent non discriminatory an objective the government says they want a 5 trillion economy by the next 5 years but to achieve this goal we will have as i said earlier to generate employment and therefore msmes play a crucial role we must not forget the example of west germany now germany where the entire german industrial heart, heartland parts of it being north rhine westphalia is based on a model where you have small and medium enterprises very often family owned i don't necessarily recommend that but that's the model that they've developed and all these industrial homes industrial businesses have developed and not only do they contribute to the german economy the european economy but they also contribute to the world economy because they are leading innovators they are leading developers they keep the german economy robust and they also provide wonderful technology cutting edge technology and business models and development for countries such as india and therefore we have a lot of these small to medium german companies which come here and which have entered india in the last few decades i would also recommend this book which is very thorough very detailed and a wonderful commentary on the msme and related laws as a must read for lawyers for uh, students and of course for academics the book provides a fascinating critique and the challenges which are found i believe at page 234 should hopefully and i mean really hopefully be considered by the government of the day to further legislative and social policy i compliment the authors thank you so much for doing a wonderful job and we hope to have many more books and revised editions even of this book thank you very much Thank you sir for highlighting these extremely relevant aspects I would now like to invite Dr Amit George advocate high court of delhi to deliver the vote of thanks
Thank you, Nehreen. Uh, Honorable Justice Sanjay Kishan Call, Honorable Justice Rajiv Shakda, Mr. Sudhat Luthra, Senior Advocates, Honorable Judges in the audience, Learned Senior Advocates, my senior colleagues at the bar, and my friends. Well, uh, today, not much needs to be said about the subject matter of the book because ultimately the illustrious speakers have already enlightened us on what exactly the book really purports to do. But it is personally a very touching moment for me today because uh, today I have my Lord Justice Shakdar and my Lord Justice Call on the dais. And when I started my career, when I started arguing matters independently way back in 2010, the first matter I argued on my own was before my Lord Justice Shakdar. And since he did bring up the topic about the smiling assassin, I think I will <laughs> provide some context to where that came from, even though if I may be digressing for five minutes. So this was a matter my father gave me to argue in an arbitration proceeding where he had suffered a slightly arbitrary order at a preliminary procedural stage. So he wanted me to take it up in a section 37 appeal. Now, you know, the father-son relationship is complex, especially when the father's in the same profession. So over the dinner table, when I went through the matter and my boss, my guru in the profession, who I first worked with was Justice Rajiv Sahai in law, somebody who was always a stickler for procedure and reading the file. So when at the dinner table, I asked my father that I had a doubt as to how this appeal was maintainable. Now, my father said once he heard that, that how can you even ask this question? Look at how shocking the order is. Do you think any judge will even ask you if this is maintainable or not? Now, this coming from a father, then obviously you're like, oh, yeah, that must be correct. So I swallowed it. Now, the next day, I go into court, all guns blazing, completely prepared on the merits. And the first question that Justice Shakdar asked me is, how is this maintainable? Now, when I turned around, my father isn't there. So, I <laughs> so now I need to deal with this on my own. So, but that is a credit to the great man that 40 minutes I went at it. And I had flagged the file so meticulously. I had made so many notes. But when the question started coming, as every young lawyer, that file which was full of notes, that paper, and I'm the last one to make color jokes, but when those questions started, that paper turned whiter than Justice Shagdar. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see anything. And in that absolute, in the middle of that absolute disaster, Justice Shagdar says, do you want to withdraw? I'll give you liberty. I mean, I was down, I was out. He could have thrown out that matter. But he gave me that liberty. Now, the interesting part is that was on maintainability. Three years later, finally, the award also comes against us. And now Justice Shagdar is back in the arbitration roster. Now I come in a section 34 in the same order. And I tell Justice Shagdar, my Lord, this is a case where Lordship said not at that stage, but at this stage. And Justice Shagdar set aside the award on that very ground. <laughs> at the 34th stage. So my father obviously beamed and said, yes, that's my son. <laughs> so what I wanted to say was that that was my first appearance in court. My entire life, I could have had that traumatic memory, even though it may not matter much today. But when I look back on it, it is one of the sweetest memories of my life, thanks to the kindness of Justice Shakti. Now, in matters where I did not have such a smooth landing, if I had to take an FAOS, my Lord Justice Call was then on the division bench. <laughs> so his kindness repeated. And I remember he would tell us in open court, he would openly say, if a young lawyer is there, he will get more indulgence. So some of us are more cheeky and more keen to take taking advantage of this. So in one matter where I went on and on and he was starting to get a little tired of the arguments, I then suddenly said, but my Lord, as a young lawyer, I can take that privilege. And Justice Call immediately light up and, up and said, yes, take 10 more minutes. <laughs> The fate didn't change, but I got my 10 minutes. <laughs> so therefore, on a personal level, it is a very gratifying experience for me today to have my Lord's Justice Call and Justice Shagda here. And it is also a fond memory for me as to how a non-existent legal knowledge today is at least at a micro level, if not more. So therefore, and all of you in the audience, thank you so much for coming out here. And I am eternally grateful to all of you. I am also especially uh, grateful to our extremely competent research team, Ms. Aratrika Bhomik, Ms. Uh, Ms. Nehreen Mehra, Mr. Samyantak Sen, and Mr. Rishank Tiwari. These kids, while being in law school, 
they worked so hard and without them there was absolutely no possibility that this book could have come out in fact they are the real stars i believe i like to say that tariq and me are here uh, i would say that tariq and me are here only for the glamour quotient the book actually belongs to them so thank you so much everybody for being here and uh, i'm thank you so much to my lord justice nageshwar rao for having graced the occasion and uh, i am also deeply obliged to all of you who came here and as my lord justice call said as far as msme sector is concerned it has continued to dwell throughout the ages policies have changed and there have been a lot of different policy responses but one thing which has remained the same for the last several decades is the snacks at the indian law institute so therefore that has not changed at all so therefore let us all go back in time and we can have something which has been brain food for judges and lawyers for decades together so i invite all of you to kindly stay back and have some tea and some snacks with us and once again thank you so much from all of us for being here thank you so much